Hello everybody, welcome back to Studio Azio on our day 3 coverage of all things AM5. And today, we have something a little more extreme. Ugh. Ooh. This right here. We'll be reviewing on the ASUS ROG Crosshair X670E Extreme Motherboard. That is the one right here. And right off the bat, I have to mention that this board feels really solid as well as being really heavy as well. Aesthetically speaking, I really like how this board looks with its futuristic, more cyberpunk looking design. As well as the bottom part here also having a powder coated metal shroud to ensure that the chipset and the M.2 over here is kept cool. So overall the whole board certainly looks very premium. Continuing from the aesthetic of the boards, uh, I would like to touch on the two LED screen that's on this motherboard. That's right, there's actually two LED screen. Now the first one is actually right here at the side of the IO shroud over here. And ASUS dubs it the Anime Matrix. Anime? Matrix over here. And it allows you to put all your favorite GIFs right here. And it will turn it into a more pixel-like version of that GIF. Now the second LED is actually right here. Now this is actually not an M.2 heatsink to our surprise. This is actually a VRM midboard heatsink. Now the LED over here can also, same as here, you can put a GIF on it. But if you leave it at the default settings, it will show you core information such as your CPU temperature as well as your postcode when you're turning on your system. Now the bottom part of the board also gets some RGB treatment. Uh, being the ROG logo over here, getting the lighting treatment. Now besides the aesthetic purpose that's right here, the metal shroud over here also provides the beneficial cooling for the chipset and the M.2 as mentioned previously. Moving back to the main area around the CPU, of course we have here the AM5 socket. Along with the AM5 bracket that allows for a lot of AM4 coolers to be directly compatible with it. The Crosshair Extreme will have of two 4 plus 4 power connectors, ensuring you get enough power when you decide to overclock the new Ryzen 7000 series of processors. Next, let's jump to the VRM of this board. Now, this being the crosshair lineup, you can expect the VRM to be beefy. With 20 power stages rated at 110 amps each, you can be confident that any processor you throw at this, you'll be able to overclock it to your heart's content. And to help with the overclocking, ASUS has also implemented a few extra features. The first being Ryzen Core Flex, which is a set of highly configurable algorithm that allows you to control things like the CPU temperature limit, uh, EDC or electric design current, as well as the PPT, package power transfer. There's also a purposely installed onboard clock generator that provides a second BCLK or base clock that is separate from your processor's own Infinity Fabric, Northbridge I.O., PCIe or memory. Now all this means that you'll be able to fine tune all your overclocking settings down to the most precise level. Now on the subject of overclocking, let's have a look at the memory slots as well as the overclocking capabilities for this motherboard on its memory. For the new series of Ryzen, AMD has implemented a new overclocking profile dubbed EXPO or AMD Extended Profile for Overclocking. Now of course, the Crosshair Extreme is able to take advantage of that as well as having some extra setting for its memory. The first being AEMP to allow RAM kits with locked PMIC or Power Management Integrated Circuit to be tuned as well. Meaning even RAM kits without EXPO or DOCP can have its frequency and timing adjusted as well. Other than that, the familiar DOCP is returning as well. For RAM that doesn't have EXPO, but has had its overclocking profile validated by ASUS. Moving on to the bottom area part of this motherboard, we can see that the X670E Extreme has three PCIe lane, two of which are full lane PCIe Gen 5 lanes. The top lane over here runs at X16 bandwidth, while the bottom lane over here only runs at X8. Of course, if you decide to run both of them together, 
both of them will only run at x8 bandwidth as they need to split their bandwidth apart. And the most bottom lane over here, we have a X4 slot that's running at PCIe Gen 4 with an X1 bandwidth. Now onto the storage option for this motherboard. And I think I can safely say that this motherboard will suit anyone that likes a lot of storages, especially for NVMe storage. Now let's start with what's available on board for this motherboard, where you get two M.2 for this motherboard built-in, and both of which runs at PCIe Gen 5, and both of them also supports the ASUS QLatch M.2 feature, which is, um, it basically means it's toolless, so you don't need to use any M.2 screwdrivers for it, which is very convenient for technicians. You also get six SATA slots on board for your motherboard, uh, these being for your older drives such as your SATA SSD, hard disk, or perhaps your older DVD drives. Moving on to the storage option that's not part of the board, ASUS provided you with two options to further expand on your storage options. The first one being the Gen Z.2 storage expansion, which is uh, actually a mainstay on a lot of ASUS Extreme board before this. This Gen Z.2 allows you to expand your M.2 by two more as it supports two more PCIe Gen 5 NVMe. Now the next option after this is an expansion card that's provided by ASUS as well, which kind of looks like a mini graphic card. It will allow you to increase and expand your NVMe storage by one more and it also supports PCIe NVMe Gen 5. So a lot of high speed storage options for you to choose from. Now let's move on to the rear I.O. of this motherboard. Something that I'm sure a lot of technicians will appreciate is of course pre-installed I.O. shield, always nice to see. And of course, other than that, you also get two more quality of life buttons with the first one being a BIOS flashback buttons. This allows you to update your BIOS to the next generation perhaps of Ryzen even if you don't have the processor for it yet. A very nice feature to have as well as a clear CMOS button, which I'm sure for anyone that have done overclocking before, this is a very convenient button to have at the back of your I.O. Then onto the USB. You get a nice amount of it with four USB Type-C, with two of them running on the USB 4 with Intel JHL8540 chipset. One will be running on the USB 3.2 Gen 2 X2, and one more will be running on just USB 3.2 Gen 2. Whereas the rest of the 8 USB will be the standard Type-A USB, all of them will be running on the USB 3.2 Gen 2 as well. But do take note that the classic PS2 port has been absent from this board, so extreme overclockers, do take note on that if you prefer to use an older PS2 mouse and keyboard as uh, it may be more convenient during overclocking sessions. It's also worth mentioning that two of the mentioned USB Type-C with USB 4 are also usable as display port with enough bandwidth to output at even 8K displays. Going to the side of the USB, we'll see two Ethernet ports. One will be a 10 gigabit port controlled by the Marvel Action chipset and one more will be a 2.5 gigabit port controlled by Intel LAN chipset. As for wireless connection, the newer Wi-Fi 6E will be present on this board and will enable support for the newer 6 GHz connection besides the older 2.4 and 5 GHz standard. The newer Bluetooth 5.3 will also be present on this board. So for wireless connectivity, you'll be pretty much set for this board. And for audio, you get your standard array of 3.5 mm jacks, one being the line out, another being line in, mic in, a rear speaker, and the last one being a C slash sub. All of them being gold plated, so looks very fancy. And you also get a SPDIF out. And all this will be controlled by the Supreme FX 7.1 surround sound high definition audio codec ALC4082. This enables audio resolution of up to 32 bit or 384 kHz. And you will have 7.1 surround sound support as well. Finally, let's get into the headers that are present on this motherboard. Starting with the fan headers, where we'll find eight fan headers present on this board. And that's a lot of fan headers, with two of them being for water pumps. And of course, if you need even more headers, the Crosshair Extreme does come with a ROG fan controller, which will provide six more additional fan headers, as well as six more ARGB headers. Speaking of which, 
The board itself also comes with one three pin ARGB header and a one newer six pin ARGB Gen 2 header, which allows you to split it into two standard ARGB headers. Now the board will have two front USB type C headers. One of them being a Gen 2 X2, while the other one being a Gen 2. Two USB 3.2 Gen 1 headers can be found at the side as well, and two USB 2.0 header. The Type C with the Gen 2 X2 support will be able to deliver powers of up to 60 watt as long as you plug in the 6 pin PCIe power that's right next to the 24 pin motherboard power. So this means that you can technically charge a laptop with that. And right next to that, you can find the power button and a flex key which allows you to reset or start the motherboard without using your casing, along with a postcode right above it. Now the front audio header or connector will be found at the bottom left of the board, like most of the other motherboards right now, with a chipset of ESS Sabre 9218PQ DAC for lower noise distortion. There will be two more buttons next to that which are unique to the Crosshair Extreme and that's BCLK Plus and BCLK Minus which are special physical buttons for you to increase and decrease the clock speed of your processor. Something extreme overclockers may find fun and useful. Next to that, you'll find the Liquid Nitrogen 2 mode button or LN2 mode button which allows you to turn on the motherboard even at extremely low temperatures. A slow mode can also be found next to that as well, which is useful for extreme overclockers in the case if your processor goes too fast. Now nah, I'm just kidding on that. It's actually for you to use to have a more stable posting, useful for extreme overclocking. And finally, there will be three buttons at the bottom right of the board. One being the retry button for the board to retry its previous BIOS setting. Another being the BIOS switch button to allow you to switch from one BIOS to the next as there are multiple BIOS on this motherboard. And the last being the safe boot button to allow you to have a safer post to your BIOS as, as well as operating system. So that's all from this board. But before I wrap up this video, I want to talk about some things that are included with this board as well but are not part of the motherboard. First, an ROG screwdriver with a Phillips head one is included with the board and it's actually quite a high quality screwdriver. The ROG True Voltition is also included which allows the user to monitor, detect and visualize power delivery of their motherboard. A 1 to 3 pin ARGB splitter, a 1 to 2 pin ARGB splitter cable, two 1 to 4 fan splitter in addition to the previously mentioned ROG fan controller are provided as well. One RGB extension cable, three SATA cable, which are sleeved as well, so that's always a very nice touch. And a three-in-one thermostat cable pack is also provided. You also get a ROG thumb drive for your driver as well, as opposed to the standard CDs. So that's a very nice touch. And that's all from us for the walkthrough of the ROG Crosshair X670E motherboard. Certainly a very feature-packed board and that's very suitable for extreme overclocking, enabling you to get every single drop out of your new Ryzen processor. Now, who do we think this motherboard is actually for? Well, it's certainly targeted towards the extreme overclocker crowd as it provides a lot of support for them, as well as like a slow mode and a liquid nitrogen mode. However, other than that, I feel that this board will may, may be suitable for anyone that's looking to go deeper into the AM5 platform. As if we follow the record from AMD with their AM4 platforms that lasted so long, I think it's safe to assume that the AM5 platform will be here for quite some time as well. So perhaps when Ryzen 8000 and 9000 drops, if you're still rocking this board, I think it's a board that can last for a very long time. So it could be suitable for anyone that is looking for the long term with the AM5 platform. I think I'll, I think I'll be getting one myself. Before we go, I'd like to give a special thanks to ASUS Malaysia for providing us such an impressive board to have a look around. And of course, if you're interested in getting your hands in this board, you can find us at Azure Online at our Facebook page. Do remember to like, 
share, subscribe, and follow us at our respective social media as we try our best to prepare more AM5 and Ryzen 7000 content for you guys to watch. That's all from me today. Bye-bye and take care. Ugh. <laughs>